craft development every day. And I'll also talk a little bit about program and how we see the management of the program, in particular the integration between the, uh, the today's running programs and of course the Sharklet and the new. Uh, and and in, in particularly how we're going to try and de-risk this program. Because we do recognise that uh, this is the cash cow of the company. And clearly we don't want to put that at risk, we want to make sure we manage it in a very uh, efficient and a very safe and reliable way. So I'm going to try and cover those key points with you this morning. John's touched already on where we are in terms of the fuel efficiency. I would add to the comment that he made, I mean one of my other part-time jobs is, uh, is lobbying with the UK government and government relations. And, and certainly I know when I talk to politicians, they do see aerospace as being a soft or easy target. And that's an issue that we as an industry have to combat. And we're not yet doing it as effectively as we should. I think we've got a pretty good story to tell, but we've got to get our message across against some very strong lobbying from the green uh, groups. And certainly when I talked to them before Christmas about NEO, while there was still some doubt in our minds about doing it, the reaction of the politicians in the UK was, was one of horror. They were basically saying, you know, you could make all this improvement, but you're not sure if you're going to do it. And, and clearly they were already sharpening their pencils. And if we hadn't preempted that with what we've done, and I think now we've got a very good story to tell about what we're doing, uh, it certainly has helped to take a lot of the heat out of that situation. And it shows that we as an industry are doing everything we can to incorporate all of the, the technological tools that are in our hands. In terms of the engines themselves, sorry, I should go just a little bit in terms of adaptation of the aircraft. One of the things we're trying to do to de-risk this program is very much focus on minimum change. And we are conscious because we've got lots and lots of creative engineers. Yeah? Our, our engineers love coming up with new ideas and, and developing new things. That's what, that's what engineers want to do. Clearly, if we're not careful, we could end up with a situation where this becomes an all-new aeroplane very, very easily. Uh, and, and so part of my job, uh, along with Wolfgang and the team, is to say we've got to put a certain amount of realism into how we do this. We're doing that because we want to keep a high degree of commonality from the customer point of view, and because we want to have a de-risking in terms of the technical challenge of the program and a very fast ramp. So in essence, what have we done? You can see the areas of change here, and there's, there's not many of them. Uh, in terms of the, of the flight deck area, we're talking about some changes to the flight control computers to, to compensate, to, to deal with the, the larger engines and the new fuel system management. We're talking about dealing with the, the implementation of the shackles. But really, we're talking there about software changes. We're not talking about a completely new flight deck or a completely new set of systems. And that's one of the reasons why John's two hours conversion time on a laptop that actually come, comes about. In terms of strengthening, we've got two phases of strengthening. We've got to go through a wing strengthening on the outboard part of the wing for the shackle, and I'll come back and show you that in a bit more detail uh, with a couple of slides at the end. We've got a completely new pylon, and that's really the only part of the aircraft that is going to be significantly different. The new pylon and you'll see that, I think this afternoon, you're going over to saint Eloi to our pylon facility, and they'll explain to you a little bit more about what we're doing in terms of uh, pylon change. And then some strengthening of the inner part of the wing. And I'll show you how we, we plan the integration of those two phases. But the key point is, you look at the rest of the aeroplane, and it, it is as it is. Uh, your spares, support, your ground support equipment, tooling, manuals, etc., are all as they are today. You don't have to worry about that an integration or an airline operation point of view. In terms of the engine technology, I think we've seen uh, both engine manufacturers being extremely aggressive in what they want to do in terms of bringing their best ideas from previous programs. Pratt in particular, clearly with the GTF, we spent a lot of time uh, analysing what they were doing with the GTF because we know that the concept of GTF is not new, it's been around in the industry for quite some time. Uh, and, and clearly some of those ideas were, were, were the flavour of the month many years ago, but if, again because of fuel price or because of technical issues at that point in time, they didn't come to fruition. 
I think the progress that Pratt have made, and, and we're also conscious of some of Pratt's uh, de engine development experience before some of you throw that in my face, uh, we're well aware of some of the issues that they've been through. But we actually think now that they're very well advanced in terms of building demonstrators. And if we look at all the test rigs that they've been running on the gearbox, and the gearbox is, is clearly the, the critical technical question in this, running it in all conditions with degraded oil, all temperature variations with uh, gears, you know, out of alignment, etc., looking at every failure mode. They've done a lot to convince themselves and to convince us that they've got a technological solution. And of course, our friends at GE are also working very hard to have a, an effective solution using ideas that they've developed both in, in, in earlier military programs and civil programs, and of course right through into the uh, 787 development. In terms of the, the aircraft itself, we said we wanted to go with a very uh, mature process. We're not launching a lot of new design tools, a lot of new product data management tools, because often when we, we start out on a new program, we tend to be at that point changing the CAD systems, changing the configuration management processes. In this case, we're not going to do that. We're using the proven tools and, and the processes that are running well in the Airbus system today. We are bringing forward some benefits and improvements that we've got from the A350 XWB engine development, and we'll be incorporating that into the process. But we're trying to keep that, again, to uh, uh, an absolute minimum. And also at the same time, of course, we've got some lessons learned from the rest of our other development programs, and I'll touch on that in a few moments. And, and for our engineering colleagues, it's about trying to use the best tools and techniques to try and get this development done in a, a timely way. The elements of that clearly is on resource planning, uh, because that was one of the issues that we've had to carefully manage uh, to make sure that we've got not only the right quantity of resource, uh, but also the right quality, the right skills of people at the right time. The number of people that are involved in this program isn't enormous, uh, before you ask. It's a little bit over 900 in terms of engineers, so it's a number that we think is quite manageable, keeping in mind that in Airbus we have uh, a total engineering population that's over 20,000. If you count what's uh, in our permanent headcount and our in situ contract engineering headcount, I don't count what's in the, the risk sharing partners. But clearly, with that team, it's a, it's a big population. And the neo demand in, in terms of resource is relatively small in terms of the overall picture. I think the other issue that's very important on the resource is that we've made very good progress on the shark clip, much better than we had actually anticipated. Uh, and we're going, it's really going with gangbusters on shark clip and, and uh, the engineering guys could comment on how they're doing with the main gate reviews. But in terms of performance, in terms of reducing risk, it really is going well. Uh, particularly in our engineering team in the UK, who are doing a, a lot of the work around the wing change. And that's allowed us to get much more confident about the program. And, and clearly that's what's behind this move forward. Uh, it's a combination of getting a lot more confidence with the engine guys, particularly PW, but also at the same time a lot of confidence in terms of what we're getting from the Sharklet development. And that's really what's encouraged us to, to cash in some of the good work that we see and, and get into the market uh, as, as early as we can. That plus, of course, some strong, strong demand from customers. In terms of lessons learned, clearly we are always looking, as you know, and Lessons learned from previous programs, from 380, from, uh, from A400M. Uh, and clearly here we're, we're trying again to take this minimum risk approach so that we, uh, we don't repeat some of the mistakes we've made in the past. And we have an integrated way of working. One of the things you'll see this afternoon is the integrated plateau in saint -Eloi. We've actually got uh, the, the both engine manufacturers and both nacelle manufacturers working there. We've got them. Uh, co-located but separated because clearly there are confidentiality issues but they're working with our teams who are doing the pylon design so that we get an integrated solution for pylon, nacelle and engine because we can, if we do that in a clever way, tweak another little bit of performance out of the, of the integrated propulsion system. And we think in terms of partners, we're, we're taking again a minimum risk approach. 
the supply chain that we're going to use for the NEO is exactly the same supply chain that we've got working today on, the, on the, today's single oil family. We're not about to go and find a whole bunch of new risk sharing partners. Uh, the major changes we've got with the pylon, we're doing the pylon ourselves in our own facility, you can see that today. And of course we're working with well-established nacelle suppliers in, uh, in Goodrich and Aircell. And so we see that as being again a way of keeping risk in the programme to an absolute minimum uh, and letting us drive quickly to our solution. In terms of ramp up and, and market expectation, I think this very simplistic chart, I've taken a lot of detail off, but this simplistic chart is trying to show you is that we see the situation where if we had carried on with the current family over a relatively long period of time, we could have seen uh, some period of decline at some stage. But what we want to do, of course, if we look at the way this is going, with the Sharklet, we're going to go very quickly with Sharklet implementation. And we will actually be building components, Sharklet type components, into our wings this year. So we're actually on with that now in terms of the centre wing box. There are actually parts being made now that are in machine that will go into the centre wing box this year. And we will gradually be implementing uh, Sharklet equipped components. And clearly what we want to do as we go through 2012, we will then have a significant amount of the aircraft going through the system with wings that are Sharklet ready. And of course then what we want to do is we complete the certification of the, of the Sharklet by the end of 2012. You will, if you wish to do it, actually be able to take off the small wing tip fence that we have today and plug and play with the new Sharklet. That's all you have to do, plug it in, change the software, and, and you're ready to go. So it's a transition that we're managing through the 2012 period. And then a very fast ramp up in terms of Sharklet availability. It depends on the demand of the customers. Not everyone might want to go with Charter, but I think there will be a, a, a strong level of demand. And then clearly on NEO, John talked about it already, so we start in the 2015 phase, and, and clearly at the end of 2015, we'll be coming with the, with the NEO-powered aircraft, and he talked about a ramp up up to 2018. That, of course, depends on customer demand, but from an airframe point of view, we're really not that constrained. You know, our ability to build enough pylons, for example, won't be an issue. And the wings will be coming through neo ready. There, there isn't going to be by that time any differentiation. There will be one standard as, as far as wing is concerned. So, how to guarantee the, the EIS in, in, 20, in October 2015 and how to secure that very fast ramp up. I think the key points I've probably touched on already. Minimum change to the aircraft that we've got in place today. Uh, the supply base that we know and love today, so we're not significantly changing that. We will also invest in some production flexibility. And we've looked carefully at this because it was something that was very important to our shareholders. They wanted to be convinced, you know, what happens if you have a major blow up in an engine development at a certain point in time? Does that mean we suddenly end up with a the whole single aisle growth program collapsing and, and of course the impact that that would have on Airbus and EATS. Uh, so we're, we've actually built a number of uh, firewalls uh, through our main gate reviews into that process where we can monitor what's going on. We will invest in some duplicate tooling where we can quickly change forward and back. But one of the key things we're trying to do here, if you think of the critical parts like the wings, there are the, in, in terms of the design that we're making here, the, the wing jigs themselves will be the same wing jigs. Whether they're building a, a wing for a Sharklet or a Neo, or even for the today's in-service standard, all we're going to do is adapt those jigs. So all the jigs that we've got in Groton, we're not going to be building uh, you know, a huge family of new jigs to build these variations, because the adaptations are relatively small, and can be managed within the configuration of the jigs and tools that we have today. That also helps, of course, in terms of keeping investment to an absolute minimum. Wolfgang is going to talk a little bit more later about what we're doing in the interim period, because we're not going to sit back and say, well, you've got the Sharklets now, and in, in 2015 you'll, you'll get the NEO, so you know, the, the engineers should stop work for the next two or three years. First of all, it's not the, it's not the normal way. 
and, and they like to keep working. And they've got a number of improvements, and I don't want to steal Wolfgang's uh, thunder because he's going to talk a little bit more about that later on. But clearly there's a number of things today in terms of runway overrun protection, electronic flight bag, uh, that we think the, the guys have got some very innovative and, and, and strong ideas that will help us as a marketplace. You see the implementation schedule in terms of sharklets. The Spaceflex, John talked about it earlier, we're not going to save up all of these things and put them on Neo. What we're saying is if we've got good ideas today that make sense for today's customers, let's get them on the airplane as sensible as quickly as possible. Let's not wait until 2015. And then you can see in terms of the way we see the ramp up of the, of the various uh, permutations of Neo. Uh, the Sharklet, I think John touched well in terms of what the benefits are. Uh, from our point of view, I think the schedule you probably know, so I won't, I won't waste too much time uh, over that. But the question was to say, you've got Sharklet and you've got Neo, so how, how are you going to manage that? And, and we wanted to just try and bring a couple of pictures into that to, to uh, simplify. This is us looking at the, at the main wing box of the, of the 320 family today. And, and if I was to make a kind of a simplified uh, presentation of this, we're saying that everything from rib 8 outwards, for, from a sharklet point of view, is where we need to do some strengthening. When we're doing that strengthening, we're talking about uh, restudying the, 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 uh, the loads, uh, particularly some of the, the loads in terms of uh, yaw and torque because of the bigger thing, and because of the, the loading that it brings to the thing. But it's not a fundamental redesign. We're not changing the configuration of the spar. We're not going to any intermediate spar or, or anything else. It is basically today's design. The control surfaces, the, the, the slats and flats, the actuation system are all as today's wing uh, because the low speed performance, etc., is, is all well under control with the configuration we've got. So we don't need to go and redesign all of our, our high lift devices. It's a, it's a very straightforward process. It's mainly about strengthening of the spar and of the roots. And in some cases, those parts will probably end up looking very much like they do today, but they'll have some very important extra material in some very critical areas. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not a change of material. We're not doing anything, you know, we're not putting anything radically different into the wing from a material concept. So, very much, if you think from, uh, from uh, Rib 8 outwards, we're going to do on the shark one. And the guys have come up at the Rib 27, as I said at the end, with a very neat solution. And so you'll actually be able to take an aircraft with today's wingtip fence and, and plug it on to the end of the wing in production. Uh, and then later on, if you, if you decide you wanted to change it, you could actually change it. You can put on the sharkler, and, and that's something we want to do in, uh, in a relatively short period of time. I think one day was the target. I don't know where going if you're still banking on one day. Right? One day works for me. So with a one day shop visit, if you like, then we expect to be able to take off the wingtip fence and, and put on a shark. And then, I think as we go into the, uh, the uh, situation of NEO, then most of the loading is a little bit more involved. And clearly then we're, we're looking more at static uh, loads being the predominant question that we need to manage. And so we've got some reinforcement. But what we're doing today is actually making for the centre wing box, we're doing all the modifications pretty much in one pass. So we think we'll have it done in a way that uh, it'll take care of both sharply and Neo without having to have two iterations of it. Uh, there may be some people that say, well, doesn't that mean to say you're going to have a stronger wing, and therefore there might be some people that don't want to take uh, sharklets, for example, so aren't they going to be carrying a penalty? Well, Wolfgang and the team have already thought of that as well, and they've got a, a very a, a good weight reduction program that they've been working on for some time. It's, it's been in the pipeline for quite a while. Uh, and that really means that whether you, if you then decide I'm going to take today's wingtip fence, you'll not notice the difference. If you take a delivery of, a, of an aircraft uh, last year and you take an aircraft next year, you'll not be able to tell the difference in terms of fuel burn performance of those aircraft, whether they are uh, sharklet ready aircraft or not. So I think, again, it's a, a good incorporation uh, of, of some, some pretty sound engineering work. So, in summary, I think the 15% uh, higher fuel efficiency 
and clearly that's what we want as a, as a launch condition. It doesn't mean to say we're going to stop at that point. We will continue to work with the engine guys to squeeze further improvements out of that, and I think there is potential for us to do that. The same type rating, the same type certification, so interchangeability. Uh, very much uh, a, a simple approach in terms of the, the, the uh, engine itself. From a maturity point of view, I think a very low risk approach. And we're using the systems and tools and we, we create an aircraft that's very easy for the airline to incorporate into the fleet. Thanks.